so pretty. Uh, welcome. The rest of them are tired of my face. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, students, make sure you sign in. You know, the, there it is. The candy's on its way, so don't <laughs> fret. We'll keep, you, we'll keep you hyped up as best we can. Um, I think we have one more next week, right? Where's, and this is one of our major events of this year, our 30th anniversary. She just graduated about, oh, I don't know, a few years ago. Just seems like yesterday, doesn't it? Jesus. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, as part of our 30th anniversary, I'm really happy to have Renee here. She's been done this before, but not quite like this. And I think all of you may know about her bio, but suffice it to say that her work has been celebrated around the world, really. Uh, many major museums have exhibited. I noticed you'll see the British Museum at, at uh, Yale has a rather remarkable piece up. Did, I hope they acquired it. Yeah, they did. Good. Good. Um, Renee came here about three years ago to study photography <laughs> and such. And, um, sort of blew everybody away then, and she's still blowing everybody away with her imagery using primarily herself as a vehicle to talk about racism, gender issues, stereotypes, colonialism, all kinds of things which are provocative and uh, need to be talked about, need to be diced, if you will, and laid out clear. What's remarkable about her images is not only that there's a conceptual motif underneath it all and a political motif under all of it, but it's really good imagery. It's always made with great craft and attention to detail, to staging, to all the things that are involved. And I don't know how she does that and still is in the picture herself. That's, that's a good trick. She has a long cable cord. Um, she's been exhibited in all the major museums and collections, and you know, as a New York Foundation of the Arts fellow, and a Whitney fellow, and many other things. The thing I remember actually most profoundly, going back sometime in the 90s, was a show she had at, uh, in at the Brooklyn Museum, where she hung on a cross. And, no, no, no. it wasn't on the cross? No. Yeah, my well, last supper, I'm sorry, yeah. The cross was in the black house. Yeah. <laughs> and that mayor of ours, do you remember him? Rudy yeah. Giuliani? I always thought he was what I still think of him today, then, but he's even gotten worse. He went after her, and she stood up and refused to acquiesce to his demand to take that image down. That's pretty brave and pretty remarkable. Well, and I said I was anti-Catholic, and then I said, what about Commandment 7? Thou shalt not commit adultery and have my wife and I love the cross I forgot about that. I, do, I remember the first time. And I think, I think, frankly, that incident was symbolic of where that guy was going and where he is today. So that's just a political statement, I guess. I'm really not allowed to say it here, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I said it. Um, David Rhodes, the president of SVA, at a graduation that followed that period, also stood up and defended that work and the incident. Uh, and uh, Mario Cuomo, governor of New York at the time, was on the stage as the honored guest. And, David finished with has really just ripped Giuliani apart in the public space for graduation. Some people got up and walked out, actually. You weren't there, I don't think. 
And Mario Cuomo came up and said, you know, I'm a pretty good speaker, but I can't follow this. You're, these are big footsteps to follow. So you were the center of all of that. I don't, I don't even know if you know that. I didn't know mm, that. Yeah. Anyway. Kumbi. Uni is a faculty member here at the School of Visual Arts, undergraduate and graduate, also teaches at Pratt, is a curator, writer, and teacher who deals mostly, at least in this department, with uh, other views of photography, video, and related media, or what I call the lens of screen arts, from a non-Western perspective. And she has agreed to be the interlocutor to host a dialogue and presentation with our celebrated photographer, artist, oh, photographer. Yeah. I don't separate the two. OK, that's enough of me. <laughs> started out, you know, photography had, you know, kept some respect if you knew how to light, you know, if you knew how to composition and, you know, putting an image together. People would respect that and could appreciate that. Nowadays, you know, everybody's like, well, we can fix it in post. All the nuance of, like, photography, I think, in film has been a little bit lost on a lot of people. At the first show that I did was um, the Bad Girl Show which was at the New Museum, and it was curated by Marsha Tucker. And she found me at the Whitney program, basically. And it was a seven-foot photograph of my 18, myself and my 18-month-old son, where I'm nude and I'm wearing stilettos, and I'm holding him horizontally across in the position of action for a mother. And um, that was the beginning. Now? Okay. Hello. Um, so I chose that way to start. So should I just click? Okay. So, okay. Um, primarily because we have students who make photo and also do installation. So I wanted you to talk us through statue from conception, why you decided to sculpt the statue. OK. Um, so that statue, and that installation, that was done for the end of the Whitney Independent Study Program. Um, I was the first woman at that time in your 25-year existence to dare to get pregnant and have a child. Um, and it was kind of shocking to me because I had no idea how like, the art world reacted to women you know, when you're pregnant, because I already had one. And I remember I found out I was pregnant. The program starts in September. I found out I was pregnant in October. So I go in and I say, you know, to my colleague, you know, hey, I'm pregnant. And everybody looked at me like I had some terminal disease or something, or, or like, you know, something really bad was going to happen. And I didn't really understand it. And then they articulated, they said, but well, what are you going to do? I mean, like, <laughs> like your career is finished before it even started. And I was like, what are you talking about? 
And then I came across a magazine called Meanings by Mila Shore. And ironically enough, she had an article about motherhood, apple pie, and being an artist. And she had interviewed like, I don't know, 24 art, female artists. And it was just like one horror story after the other. They were like, oh my God, you know, when a curator comes over, I've got to hide the children, I got to hide the toys, I got to act like, you know, I don't have any kind of life, it's only art, because if they think that I have a kid, they're, they're not going to take me seriously anymore. And I was like, you're kidding me. Like, I just come out of the fashion industry where I had my first kid. And I mean, they're not exactly scholars over there. And <laughs> I was like, they were like, cool. They were like, just don't break your water on our shoot. You know what I'm saying? And, and even when I went back to work in fashion, you know, I would just go off in another room and breastfeed my baby. And, and that was it. And everybody was fine with it. They were totally open. And then I got into the art world, and it was like, these people don't have mothers or something. Like, they were hatched or something like that. So I was like, wow, this is like really deep, right? So that was like the first kind of inkling that I was going to go down this path of um, dealing with issues around motherhood. Uh, then the second thing that happened was actually a result of my husband, which pushed me to do this particular piece that you have up there, was that the way I tell the story, some women are like kind of horny when they're pregnant. So like I wanted to make love to my husband. My husband said, I don't find you attractive like this. I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, this was like a collaborative effort. <laughs> and uh, like, if anybody's supposed to service me now, it's you. <laughs> So, <laughs> so when he said that, I was like, okay, that's cool. I just went to his checkbook, I took a check, and I went down to this place called Johnson Atelier, and I had a whole body cast basically made of me seven and a half months pregnant, and had it poured, excuse me, poured in plaster and whatnot, and um, this installation with the photograph of him, the uh, world basketball, and then myself, yo mama at home. And then it had an audio track that said, so baby, don't fuck with me, and you know, on and on. So it was pretty successful. People liked it at the Whitney program, because I felt like I had to, I couldn't, I w it wasn't about me trying to like hide or you know, skirt the issue. It was sort of like, whoa, like you're pregnant, and Let's deal with this. Also, I have to give much credit to Mary Kelly, who was also one of the sort of program directors at that time, who did a piece back in the 70s about motherhood and being an artist, which was called Postpartum Document. But back in the 70s, she couldn't even like remotely show the child. So she just showed the, the diaper with like some poop in it or some you know, skid marks or whatever, you know. And that was the piece, because like if she showed the baby, they would have like written her off as like, oh, you're not serious in this, that, and the next thing. So that also helped me to feel the power, so to speak, that I, I needed to put this out there. Thank you. Uh -huh. So I really enjoyed this series because she travels. Right. Um, and I wanted you to speak a little about, in the process of deciding you were going to show Missy's life, mm -hmm. was travel included in that? Did you know you were going to go to these different places? Um, I mean, I like to travel. So um, the way Missy started out was kind of like looking at, it's from the discreet charm of the bougies. Site. It's a whole body of work. And it starts out with her being basically this privileged black woman living in suburbia, which I was doing all of that at that time, in Chappaqua. Uh, and she's totally depressed and unhappy, this, that, and the next thing. Sort of like dealing with her mental issues is where it started. And one of my big premises behind it was that I 
always sort of resented the fact that whenever a black woman was having some sort of mental thing going on, usually, I don't know, they were in a crack house, they looked terrible, you know, they had dried up snot in their nose and stuff, and it was like a really bad look. But her white counterpart would be like at the Betty Ford, you know, center and, you know, wearing fantastic clothes. Yes, I'm like having issues. I'm so sad. My life is so bad. Blah, blah, blah. As I sit by the pool and just, you know, have like a, a cranberry juice or something like that. So I was like, wait a second, this is not a good representation for us as black folks. So I wanted to flip that which is what I've always sort of done. And um, so I flipped it around. So I mean, in one of the shots, you don't have it here, but if you do go to the website, it's me with my white maid and my poodle, and there's a big yo mama shown before behind me because my character, Missy, she collects Renee Cox. You know, she's practical. And um, then, so that's like sort of, I'd say, the beginning of that series. And then it goes into, like, say, a, a part two, but it's still all part of the same thing. And that's when she starts to travel the world. And basically, she's looking for herself. So, I mean, it's that old story of, like, doesn't matter where you go, but you're still carrying the same burden and the same issues in your head with you. So this is her in Ghana, but before that, she's in China, she's in Beijing, she's in Cambodia, she's in Bali, she's um, like all over the place. And do you scout for these locations? How did you choose this particular place in Ghana? Well, I like, well, this is a surf, this is Basua, and this is on the coast, and I surf. So it's a surf spot in Ghana, actually. That right? I didn't know about. Yeah. You. So, yeah. So I went there, and uh, I went there with my younger son, because he surfs too. My older one is too much to deal with surfing. You know, it's like you gotta paddle out and you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, my younger one's into it, so I took him. And um, just, it's like walking around and looking, you know, different places and stuff. And it was kind of funny in Ghana because it's like when I first got to Basua, like I had my hair like this, right? You know, natural. And like nobody paid me any mind at all. Like it was like a dirt road, it like almost run me over. And then I put that wig on. And I'm not gonna say what I'm really thinking because we got a mixed audience, but they changed their attitude so quickly when they saw that straight hair wig. <laughs> they were like rolling out the red carpet. So then I kind of got to see even more than I could see with my natural hair. You know, so I ended up back in this spot and it was perfect. You know, the color was perfect and everything just said, this is the spot. And I also had this other thing too with photography because I was so much involved. And in, if you look at this series again, in the beginning, it's so much about production. And I've always been involved with like production. It's sort of like the taking of the photograph is kind of like nothing, it's just that 60th of a second because all the work is done before. But with this, it gets more interesting because I like to think about allowing the photograph to manifest itself, which means like I have the dress, I have the shoes, I have the bag with me, but I don't know where I'm gonna shoot it until I actually see it. And that to me was kind of exciting, an exciting approach to the way that I work. Yeah. When was your first time in Africa? Ooh, my first time in Africa actually was, oh God, back in like early 80s. Where? In Cameroon. And I was one of four dancers for this group called Tim and 40. And we toured all over Cameroon. We were kind of like the Beatles. We had people screaming and hollering you know, and trying to touch us and grab us and would take my wet, disgusting, you know, T-shirts after we performed and stuff. And that was my first experience. <laughs> we met Mana Dubango. Yeah. And have you ever been to Nigeria? I'm Nigerian, so. Right, no, I haven't. I haven't been to Nigeria. Really? No, I want to go. <laughs> Invite okay. me. Totally. You know? <laughs> uh, it's like one of my next stops. 
Yeah. Okay. And so last time you were here, 2015, that you were speaking at SBA, mm -hmm. one of the things you said, and I quote, people behaving badly all the time is toxic and mental noise. Mm -hmm. That was before President Trump. Right. And at your Yale lecture, you made the signing in response to that. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to us about this? Just talk us through how that is a response to the current time. Well, it was sort of like I felt like, you know, it's just time to take back power. Um, so I looked at the Declaration of Independence and basically went off of the painting, the original and decided to fill it with, you know, black and brown people. Um, I wanted to use some period, you know, garments, uh, some African garments, some current garments as well. So that it wasn't just locked into one time frame, but it was the whole sort of array of my spectrum of people and whatnot. And um, huge production. Huge, huge, huge. I mean, this thing is like 15 feet long, wide, and six feet tall. There's like 30 some people in there, and it's shot in three parts. So it's like, uh, because you cannot control 30 people all at the same time. You would have major screw ups and whatnot, even though I know you can fix it in post. But, you know, I didn't want to have to be bothered with all of that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we just put it together. It was a lot of work. <laughs> Are your sons in it? Yes. My older son, Mr. Forbes, is over there with one of my wigs on, that, like, blonde wig over there. Okay. And my younger one is white-haired wig there. And, uh, yeah. Your jacket? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You had to leave early, so. Because it went like, it was like, this was the first shot, the second shot, the last shot. Yeah, so. This is a statement. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about making statements, um, do you consider at all your place within the larger scope of art history? I mean, I think, I mean, as artists, I mean, I'm not going to tell anybody what they're supposed to do. I mean, but for me, I feel that I have a responsibility to have an opinion and to say something and to hopefully be able to sort of change people's minds. And if I can't change your mind, at least offer them a different perspective on how things could possibly be. Um, and I don't have an issue with being a black artist, I will say that too, because I am black, it's obvious. My subject matter deals with that. And I'm not kind of, I feel that, that running away from that in a way is kind of like insulting. That like, wait, like how did you get like completely co-opted? Like you're, you're just an artist? No, it's obvious, you're a woman, you're black, and I'm proud of all of those things. So I'm not trying to skew it in any kind of way. This is going to be quick. We're almost done. <laughs> How are we doing for time? We got plenty of time. Got plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I know you want to talk a lot about Soul Cultures series. So right. that's kind of where of my question. Um, I guess, again, going back in terms of your process, that's something I talk to my students a lot about. Mm -hmm. Make your decisions before you pick up your camera, know what it is that you're going to do. Um, well, somewhat. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think you want to have, like I said before, in terms of allowing a photograph to manifest itself, I mean, you have to let that happen. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to have, like, uh, let's say the 50% of that idea. And then that other 50% is where you can drive the joy from because you don't know. When did you first learn about fractals uh, and the relationship between fractals and Africa? 
Um, well, first, I mean, looking at um, works from Molly. Um, but how I came to Fractals and Benoit, uh, his name now from Yale, who discovered Fractals and whatnot, was, I guess, through my own personal transformational journey of letting go of the ego and the egoic mind. So like I said before, I mean, I've had my bouts with depression and stuff. And the way the story goes, which sounds a bit cliche, but it's absolutely true. I was traveling in Bali. I was alone. I was in this beautiful hotel. I was the first person to ever stay in this like little villa at my own pool, everything. My own butler, who I took to a cockfight, which kind of freaked him out. But <laughs> he's just like, we don't take guests to cockfights usually. But I was like, no, but it was like a whole crowd of people there and whatnot. And I just walked into this thing and it's all men. And I have my camera with me and whatnot. And it's like, I don't know, sometimes I don't know where I get it from. I just like walk in and I'm walking around. Like I totally don't belong there. But like I did it with such authority that like none of them said anything to me. <laughs> they just let me be. So anyway, that's just like aside from the, with the butler and everything sure. like that. But um, so I went back in my room and I'm like there feeling sorry for the little me. So I'm like crying. I mean, like I'm having like a basic nervous breakdown by myself, right? And, and were you there? On what? Wait, why were you there in the first? Why not? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I had just finished doing a trip actually with my older son and we had spent three weeks in Mongolia in a polo camp and um, so he had to go back to school and so then I decided, I mean I didn't have to go back to school so I was like I'll just go on further because okay. traveling in Asia is really great. There's this airline called Air Asia. They only have cute people working for them. I've never seen anything like this in my life, I swear to God. I mean, like, it's like ugly people do not even apply. Even on the tarmac, they're cute. I mean, I was, and the other great thing about them is that they're really cheap and you can get one way tickets like all over. And their base is like Kuala Lumpur. So I had to go into Kuala Lumpur and then from there I decided, oh, why don't I go to Bali, you know, because I can surf and I can dive, and, you know do the stuff that I like to do. So that's how I ended up in Bali, on that particular trip. So anyway, I'm in my room, feeling sorry for the little me, wondering why haven't I had a retrospective? Why, why don't I have a book? Why don't I have this? Why and don't I have that? Huh? How old are you? This if is you like, I don't know, let's say 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah, okay. nine, 10 years so ago. So it was due. You yeah. So I'm like just there, like just a complete nut job. Right, and um, a friend of mine earlier had suggested that I get this book by Eckhart Tolle called Living the Liberated Life and Dealing with the Pain Body. And um, so I had it as an audio book. I tried to listen to Eckhart before, but I couldn't because he spoke so slowly and so deliberately. And when you're in your egoic mind, like there's no way in hell that you can listen to this. You know, you're like, get to the point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when you're like completely, like I'd say, rock bottom, depressed, you know, like ready to shoot yourself, I put on Eckhart and I found it to be extremely calming. And like, it was, it really took me out of my head. The fact that he was so deliberate with his speech and the pauses that he takes and so on. And then he said one thing that changed my entire life. He said, why are you waiting for the world to validate you? And when he said that, it was like lights, whatever, went off. Because it's like, I'm an only child. And I'd always waited for the world to validate me. I was always waiting for people to say, oh my god, you're smart. You're, you know, you're talented. You're cute. You're this. You're that. And if people didn't say it, I got to one point in my life where which this is complete madness, I would get pissed off, you know? <laughs> I'd be like in their face, like, don't you see me? Like, what's wrong with you, you know? And, but that's a sign of madness, for sure, if you see people doing that. So, um, <laughs> so, 
So at that juncture, it, um, and then he tells you how to get out of your head. Which I like heard other people, the Dalai Lama, Wayne Dreyer, all these other people, their message is the same and they all speak the truth. But it's really about finding the person that makes it clear to you. And what Eckhart said, he goes, Well, how do you, you know, get out of your head? It's like those okay, first of all, you're dealing with your ego. Ego is not your friend, first and foremost. One has to know that. The other one, your ego, that's that thing, that entity that lives within all of us, that has that little voice that's telling you that you're a schmuck, that you're an idiot, that you're lacking something. The society that we live in is capitalist. So they add to that, too. You don't have a big enough car. You don't have a big house. You don't have this. You don't have that. You lack everything. So Eckhart says... Once you start, if you start believing in that, you also you start having all these negative thoughts that come into your head, right? And I had tons of negative thoughts coming into my head like, like machine guns. So he goes, you have to be able to address each negative thought as it comes into your head one by one. So basically, since I was there by myself, and I, as I said before, I was having this nervous breakdown, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to start doing this. And I started to do it. And so it would be like a negative thought would come into my head and I'd be like, oh, fuck you, ego. Like, I know who you are and get the hell out of my head, okay? This went on for, I mean, I had like about 10 days before I returned home to the States. I was doing it all the time because you, if each thought, like you have to do it all the time. You can't let them build up because he also talks about a thing called the pain body where those nasty thoughts, you know, fester in this chest and then one day, you know, you sort of explode or it just takes you down. It makes you sick physically, all kinds of things. So I just started doing that and it works if you can do it, you know. Now, the way he puts it, and I like to say it to people too like this, once you've suffered enough, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But if you still enjoy your suffering, it doesn't make a drop of sense to you, you know. And I got back to New York. And my husband's French, so he, you know, every sentence starts off with the problem is, you know what I'm saying, just culturally speaking. And that was one of the words that I took out of my vocabulary, like problem. Like I don't use that word because it's way too big. Like where do you start when you have a problem? So I like to use situation or challenge. And he thought like I joined some kind of cult because like I couldn't listen to like him complaining, you know, about you know the commute, Metro North, the ugly people on the train, the blah 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 blah. I was like, yo, dude, like I can't listen to this. I've got to go to my room. I've got to take my three conscious breaths and like <laughs> let this go because this is pure toxic poisoning here. So uh, that was the beginning. And then the beautiful thing that happens with this is that at a certain point when you keep doing it, you get to this zone of where you have no thought. There's no negative thinking. And that's that place where you're like totally free. And in terms of creativity, it's also residing in that place of no thought. Because like these images, there's a lot of them actually. And they're actually 3D now as well. Um, you can't, you, you know, there's no algorithm. It, there's no plan or anything like that. It's just, it begins. And for me, they're portraits. And it just, you just do it. And you don't second guess yourself. And you get like this nice flow and it's like you can kind of, you get outside of yourself and outside of your head. And that's how soul culture. And you know. can you talk to us a bit about Renee Monster at all? Well, Renee Monster, I mean, I've been a <laughs> accused of being a narcissist, which I'm not, but because, you know, previously I was in all of my work and blah, blah, blah. So with this body of work, I, you know, it's not about me. It's about everybody, really. So there's only this one self-portrait of me out of, like, 
11 three-dimensional ones and probably 100 flat ones. And these are what I call the flat ones because they are not dimensional. So. <laughs> um, to that point, so you've talked a lot about how you came to this work. How do you not now, after having worked such a long time, be, be Renee Cox? Yeah, so in this moment, in particular, becoming Michelle Obama's book is out there. The subject matter, more or less, is, is speaking to us about when she became Obama, right? Mm -hmm. And so to that same point, how are you able to maintain being an artist as opposed to engaging with this idea of the Renee Cox? Having well, worked for so all, long. First of all, I don't know if I like engage with like being Renee Cox. You know, I just am. You know what I'm saying? It's not like um, I haven't turned it into a brand yet. You know, maybe I will. But at this moment, I haven't. And um, to me, it's just about being me and being myself and, you know, and because um, I think that's the only thing you can do, right? I mean, if you're like phony, that's a lot of work. <laughs> so I just feel like I'm just me and that's it. And now I know how to be happy because whenever I have the negative thoughts, I know where they're coming from. I know how to um, change them around. And I think that to me is definitely the most important thing that happened to me over the span of my career. Because now I'm not really worried about anything. You know, I go with the flow. And I do what I need to do when I need to do it. And, you know, I'm not asking for permission from anybody. You know, the only person that validates me is me. And once I think you get to that point, you take a great burden off of your shoulders. And you are then, in fact, liberated. So that's where I'm at right now. And most importantly, have fun. You gotta have fun. If you're not having fun, don't do it. <laughs> Serious, you know? And if you don't love it, don't do it either. You gotta have passion. And um, like I tell students now, and please don't make ugly stuff. I'm tired of seeing ugly <laughs> stuff. You know, because that means you all need to get out of your head if you're making all that ugly stuff. You know? <laughs> you gotta, I feel like for me, it's like you gotta create, you create from the heart, soul, or whatever you wanna call it. And then you go to the brain, because the brain is a tool, and you're not supposed to live there 365 days a year, all day long. You're just supposed to visit it when you need to do something when you need to execute, fabricate, market, whatever it may be, then you go to the brain. But for the really good, good, potent ideas that can change you and people around you, it's got to come from the heart. That's the epicenter. And so this is my last question. Well, last-ish. What does 30 years signify? Since we are, you know, we're commemorating 30 years of the program. How do you think about the lifespan? Um, I mean, I don't really think about the years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Why would I think about the 30 years? In terms of when you <laughs> consider, when you, well, you wouldn't, but when you're right. asked the question, oh, it's been 20 years since right. you did, right. you know, X. I mean, yeah, but it's sort of like, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I mean, I kind of know what you're talking about, but it's sort of like, I don't see, like, my, um, my world, like, within the 30 years. I mean, even for my kids, you know what I'm saying? Like, I have a 29-year-old. Maybe that's the only, like, recorder or record that I have that says, oh, yeah, 30 years have passed. So you're getting older. Whoa. You know, whoop de doo what do I do? <laughs> I gotta keep on going, right? <laughs> and then I don't dwell in it, let's say that. Okay. Yeah. So let's move on. Yeah. Last question, what's next? Ah, 
No, if that's you can another tell one. Us. No, but that's another one because it's sort of like I always feel like that question it puts like pressure on people. Okay. Because then I have to say to you, you're living not in the present moment. You're projecting out now into the future. Okay. You know, and that gets you in trouble. Okay. If you like, if you're thinking about like, okay, what's next? What's next? I don't know what's next. You know, I'm saying, okay. I don't know exactly what's next. You know, I'm here today. I'm alive and well. I could be, you know, dead five minutes from now. Who knows? Do you know what I'm saying? That's just the way life works. So I don't like, I don't really do that question. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Speak from your diaphragm. <laughs> Hello. Um, first of all, you're fucking everything. Thank you so much, Liz, for bringing her. Uh, this is really enjoyable, and this feels like a really mundane question after that talk, but like, I know there's something interesting behind it. But, well, why the aversion to post, or like, what's the line? Because like, clearly you have this refinement and like, production value in the image. Like, can you what's talk the aversion to post? Yeah, like, I mean, that I get It's not like an obvious. aversion to post. It's just like... Okay, so, um, you know, obviously older, so old school, you know, worked in the dark room and whatnot. And I shot fashion, I did the commercial thing and stuff. And if you were a photographer that needed to send your stuff out to get, send your stuff out to get retouched or anything like that, you were a hack and you would never work, okay? Because the retoucher was this little white guy on the Upper East Side that had glasses that were like five inches thick brushes that had one hair on it, okay? And was there like, you know, that, 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 that. So if your stuff needed to be retouched, forget about it. Though, you know, maybe if it was an ad, advertising, maybe they might do it, but for fashion or editorial, there was no way anybody was ever gonna do that. And if you had to crop, that was another sign that you were a hack because you had to crop in camera, right? So when we got into the dark room, I basically had two things that I could do. I could burn or I could dodge, okay? And then also, too, you had to know how to light, right? Because with no light, no photography. That's just the way it works, right? So you have to have your lighting skills, and when you got into the dark room, you basically, you look at your negatives, you knew basically what they were gonna print at automatically, you know what I'm saying? Obviously, you'd want a test strip and stuff like that, but you knew. And so now when people say to me, like, fix it in post, I'm like, no, for me, that takes so much freaking longer. You know, like, I'm older now, so I don't have as much time as you young people, okay, <laughs> to waste hours Googling, how do I do this, how do I do that, me go back, uh, 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 oh, what's the shortcut for this, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, no, I want to get it done now. You know what I'm saying? So it's like the least amount of stuff I have to do in post, the better off I am. And that's my message to you know you guys. Like, you got to know the rudiments of the thing that you're doing. It's like playing an instrument. You got to know the scales. You know what I'm saying? And you got to practice the scales every day, basically. And I think now with the computer now. Don't get me wrong on some levels, because it sounds like a contradiction, because I'm using the computer now. But I feel like you still have to know how to do stuff properly before you can kind of go there. And I also feel like, I said this earlier, it's like, for me being older, I think it's advantageous for me to use the computer, because then that way I don't look stuck in my ways or something like that. Right, and it's cute for y'all young ones to be in the dark room, breathing in all the toxins, and you know, sticking your fingers in the fixer and all of that stuff that I used to do when I was your age too, and then blowing on the print, and you know, like it's a whole thing, right? So now that digital is caught up, and it's, I'm hard pressed to know if it's digital or analog. I'm like, okay, let's go with the digital. Plus, I mean, finding film and finding labs and whatnot is a big pain. So that's why you just need, you need to just know your stuff 
And then once you know your stuff, then you can break out from there and do whatever you want. But if you don't know your stuff, you know, some of the stuff I see now, it's like, I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, couldn't you like iron the fucking background? You got crumpled up sheets for a background? Like, where are you coming from? It's just like so sloppy and whatnot. But you know, that's just me. Um, I I had a question about your moving away from the word problem Um, because when I think about your work especially your earlier work I think about the problem of representation you know whether it was as a woman or as an African American or the problem of situating yourself within this art history and I'm wondering when you in your personal life moved away from the word problem if that also translated into how you thought about your work, at least moving forward, and it not so much needing to deal explicitly with maybe some of those problems that one could locate in your earlier work. But they were problems because I was in my unconscious mind. That's where I think they manifested as problems. But once I think you become conscious, then the word becomes problematic and then the word needs to be removed, I believe. So it's like, yeah, back then, yeah, they were problems, you know what I'm saying? But now I have like, I think a higher understanding that there are no problems, really. And I go back to situation or challenge. It's like saying, you know, to yourself, like I can't, you know, or I need. You know, all of these, like, I hope is another one. These are all words that I feel that don't necessarily help you progress in a lot of ways, even though hope was, like, the big one around Obama's campaign. But that kind of pissed me off, because I'm like, what are you saying, man? Like, you're just kind of perpetuating this helplessness of, like, you had nothing before, you have nothing now, and you ain't ever gonna have anything because you're sitting up here just hoping for some stuff. You know, I'm like, no, it's like, let's do it. Let's do it now. And and did your moving away from those words translate or how did it translate into how you thought about it? It translated into this new work, for sure, yeah. Hi, uh, related to that question, I I was wondering the same thing, You, you, you talked about fearlessness, mm-hmm. at least I describe it as fearlessness when you sort of got to a, a certain pivotal point in your personal life. I look at your work and it looks fearless. I mean, m- much of what I've seen. How do you think that transition re- um, reflected in your, in your work? If, if the baseline already seems quite uh, um, brave, mm-hmm. right? what, what did the work then sort of transform to? post the transition in your personal life from her? Well, like I say, I mean, to soul culture, you know, to this new work, you know, where I began to get interested in, you know, sacred geometry, fractals, you know, how all of that stuff works and whatnot, and creating new imagery, imagery that, like, I hadn't really seen to that extent. I mean, people have done this kind of thing, but I hadn't seen it done quite like that either. And that to me is important to to be original because another thing, one of my pet peeves is like, stop copying other people's stuff. Come up with your own ideas, you know what I'm saying? And um, that was important to me, the originality of it as well. Yeah. But I don't know, I didn't, did that answer your question? Kind of like... No, just... Uh, you know, yeah. I, what I think I heard is the um, fearlessness is really in terms of going somewhere you haven't been. Right. Opposed to, um, when I use the term brave, I kind of think of reception of your work. Right. You know, so, but it sounds like what you're really describing is more you going somewhere where you haven't been before as opposed to how... And that's are. also physically and spiritually. <laughs> it's both. It's not just the physical manifestation of where, because it's like, in order to, to reprogram and to begin to, you know, think like this, it's definitely going in another direction than what the general population is doing. You know, and it has to be 
like a constant reminder. You know, I mean, in some ways I could say, I mean, I felt like a, I mean, like a born again Christian, even though I'm totally not down with that at all. But I'm saying, but just in the sense of like how they're reading the Bible all the time, you have to constantly, constantly remind yourself because the society just wants to lure you in at each juncture, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't watch the news. Why? Because it's, first of all, it's depressing, and there's nothing that I can really do about it. So why am I loading myself up with all of this toxic, you know, information? You know, I don't watch Empire, I don't watch shows that undermine other people where people are being killed and this, that, and the next thing. So I'm really limited to like only your home improvement channels and stuff like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, it's, you know, it's, it's very narrow because you've got 500 stations, every station, somebody's being shot, blown up, heads ripped off, all kinds of madness, but that's madness and it's toxic. And I try to avoid all toxicity at all costs. This juncture. Yes, yes. What was the. So I read the Godwin Bay's book, and Harlem on my mind was the thing that was the turning point for him to realize he wanted to get into photography. So, what was that turning point for you? And my second question is have you thought about doing your own retro? Well, yeah, I mean, I have, but they're expensive. So you need backers for the retrospective. I mean, I was talking to somebody, I mean, like, I was talking to Chuck Close, and he was like, you need, like, at least 200,000, like, you know, number to, like, get that going. Um, in terms of a, a book or something that inspired me, well, I always wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a fashion photographer. I saw myself as Avedon or Penn, sure, you know, uh, but doing it my way. But I respected Avedon's like early work, you know, with the circus and you know the elephants and all that stuff that he did fashion-wise. So I'd say that was my um, my jump-off point. And then I did fashion for ten years, and then it wasn't until like I had my my first kid that I realized that I didn't want to do fashion anymore because it was kind of um, superficial. And, you know, in my 20s, I could talk about a pair of shoes for 20 minutes and, you know, feel really fulfilled about that conversation. <laughs> uh, but as I started to hit 30, it was sort of like, are you kidding me? Like, that's like, you know, whatever. Like, you know, you don't need to do that. And, and that's actually when I decided, well, there's two stories. One is a pivotal moment. Um, I was at Jerry's, which was a restaurant uh, bar that used to be down in Soho on Prince Street. And I used to do a lot of uh, New York Times ads and stuff like that. And I was with like a bunch of people from the Times and Ellen Von Ruthen and like a whole bunch of folks. And we're all sitting and talking about, you know, superficial fashion. And at one point, I say to them, I go, today is like an amazing day. This is the day that Nelson Mandela got released from prison after spending 26 years there, you know, for his beliefs and this and that. And I'm going off. And they all turned to me and they said, Donald and Ivana are getting a divorce. And that was what was on the front page of the Post and the Daily News on that day, too. And I was just like, oh my God, like this, I've hit, this is like rock bottom, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And then I started thinking about like, what's my legacy? Like, you know, what do I show my children? You know, I'm gonna show them some dried up fashion photographs, you know, from like 30, 25 years ago. You know, and I'm going, oh, I, showed, I shot Iman, and I shot this one, and Joan Severance, and, and they're going to be like, they're all old bitches now anyway. <laughs> so I was like, we don't care. <laughs> and I'm like, this is not good. Like, what's my legacy? So in that moment, I sort of decided that, uh, and also too at that time, 
nobody was interested in your personal work. You know, it wasn't like you could go to them and say, hi, I have 10,000 or 30,000 followers on Instagram. Why don't you give me a show? It wasn't like that. It was like, we don't care about your personal work. So it was like I had to prove myself, i.e. going to graduate school and, you know, getting my MFA degree and whatnot, which was a great experience because during that time frame, it allowed me to really explore and kind of figure out what it was that I wanted to say as an artist, you know. Before that, I would inject things into my fashion photography, but it wasn't a full-on message because it was still a commercial job and, and the work only had a 28-day lifespan because I was doing a lot of editorial. So that was that. Hi. Um, first, I just want to say thank you um, for your input on speaking about um, being a woman artist and about motherhood. Um, I think it's a conversation that's sort of very overlooked and mm -hmm. <laughs> underrepresented, so I appreciate um, you. You're a mother? I'm not, but wow. I'm a woman, so it's a, and, a, and an artist, and it's right. a consideration. And, you know, it's um, something that you don't have to consider as a male artist in the same way, so. Right, their um, prices go up when they get married. Because <laughs> then they don't have to run the streets looking for pussy. <laughs> no, <it's> like <laughs> but for the female, your prices go down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anyway, but I, I really wanted to follow up uh, the conversation that you were just having um, about the idea of legacy, particularly around um, creating work. Um, I know you've worked in ways that you're um, creating different bodies of work over a length of time, and um, particularly as we become, become more reliant on just like pushing out work very quickly um, through, you know, like our reliance on social media and that need for constant validation and the need to constantly keep up and, you know, as an artist, always be pushing something out. What are you working on next? Um, what are you doing right now? Um, but you don't have to live by that. That's no, other people putting so pressure on you. That's, exactly. You have a choice. Exactly. So Because um, most people are mad. Most people are crazy. So, no, I'm serious. So it's like, if you want to be part of that, then you're going to be part of the madness, and you'll be on antidepressants and everything else. Yeah. Or you can choose not to be part of that, too and still do your own thing. So I'm, I'm curious about how you bring that into like continuing to create work as, um, you know, as our reliance just steadily increases on this sort of you know, energy and, and mode of production. I mean, I just work at my own pace. You know, that's all I can do. I mean, yeah, I post on Instagram and stuff because you know, now I'm sort of like forced to, you know, to have like, some sort of presence. I just did the New Yorker photo thing a couple of weeks ago, and that was that was cool. You know, I gained three thousand followers in one week, so that was <laughs> <laughs> that was like fun. But you know, it's just because it's like uh, for me, just because it's there, and I'm an artist, and I think as an artist, you have to make sure people see the work. You know, that's your responsibility. So. That was a vehicle to be able to do that. But, um, and then I'll post, you know, in my stories, you know, like my travels and things like that, the day to day things. But I mean, I'm not putting any pressure on myself to have to, you know, like, you got to keep going, you got to keep doing this, you know what I'm saying? I kind of work in spurts too. Like, I'll have that, like, with this body of work, like, with the flat stuff, I mean, it probably went on for like maybe almost a year and like working like all the time, you know? I mean, like there's over a hundred of these flat guys. And then after that, then it was sort of like, okay, wait, that's cool. How do I take it a step further? And then I got into making them three-dimensional. By that, I mean actually cutting the photo paper and whatnot and you know, going in and collaging them and stuff and, and creating um, a real space. You know, like images come off like seven inches off the, the canvas, you could say, even though it's not canvas, it's wood. So that to me is like, that was sort of like another evolution. Because I wanted to create work that 
would actually get people out of their head. That people couldn't like say, oh, well, oh, that's this. Oh, I've seen that. Like you can't put it into a box. And when you look away and you look at it again, you're going to see something different. You're not going to see the same thing all the time. So that was another complaint for me as well with the three Yes. <laughs> Once you figured out the, uh, the idea of there not being any more problems and coming back to the city and moving around and having all this madness around you with the news and all that, did you also have to figure out a new way to generate the energy to keep that stuff at bay? Or is it like going back surfing, does it help with that? Well, I mean, yeah, surfing definitely helps because surfing is like a one-shot deal. You know, it's not even like skiing. Skiing, you pull over, you know what I'm saying, have a spliff, regroup, and then go down the mountain. Uh, surfing, it's like either you catch that wave or you don't. And if you don't catch it, you're going to be spun around like you're in a washing machine and then you're going to be spewed out to the shore, and then you're going to have to paddle back out to the break. So that definitely keeps you humble. I mean, like I say, surfing has the zen side, the physical side of, you know, all the paddling and everything, and then there's the instant sort of gratification of like, oh, God, I'm standing up on this wave, and it's just nature and the forces of nature that are moving you. So... Definitely surfing helps. Also, the other thing when I referred to before, like when I said like the born-again Christian, in the beginning, I would listen to Eckhart Tolle all the time, okay? I'd have it as an audio book, even if I just had one headphone in, but just as a constant reminder of how I had to sort of reprogram. It's, it's all about sort of reprogramming so, and you've got to remind yourself, because as I said before, the society is constantly trying to drag you back into the madness. Yeah. So you've got to protect yourself. And once you do that, and you do it a lot, then eventually you get the message. <laughs> it gets in there. You know? So for me now, that's why when you ask me what's in the future, I'm like, I don't know. You know? I don't want to know. You know? <laughs> it's like... You know, that would be stifling in some way, you know, because that would mean that I wouldn't be open to whatever things could be around or whatever things can come to me. So, yes. I, I wanted to ask uh, you to reflect on um, the community of other artists that you kind of came up with. I mean, I'm thinking of Lorna Simpson and Carrie Mae Weems, uh, Deb Willis. Uh, who I imagine were you were having a conversation with at that time, or at least aware that all of you were kind of breaking new ground. Mm -hmm. uh, were there conversations between you? I mean, were you kind of actively thinking about these ideas with them? Or I'm sure you were aware of their work, obviously, but were there yeah. active conversations between you? Um, not I mean, not really active conversations about it. I mean, it was much more social, you know. Um, like Carrie and I, I mean, we were like, you know, we had time together, like a show that we were both in in Scottsdale, Arizona. And it was, I would say it's more on a social tip. It wasn't like we we're sitting there, you know, strategizing and plotting like the new movement or something like that. I mean, at least not on my end. Yeah. I mean, certainly I was aware of her work and stuff and Adrian Piper and but yeah, it was more friendly than scholarly or you know academic or anything like that. So, and I mean, it's it's still like that. But, but was there some sense that um, you were kind of mutually sustaining one another, or at least it was fun to have these other artists working in similar terrain, or you felt? pretty much autonomous or fairly independent in what you were doing? I mean, I felt pretty, you know, independent, but knowing that there was this pool, you know, people that were, you know, 
working along, you know, the same line. I mean, I take my, you know, my inspiration and stuff, I mean, comes from me, you know. I'm not really looking to the other, you know what I'm saying? Because you got to go within. You know, if you're looking to the others, no matter who they are, I think that just kind of weakens you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's like, it's your message. That's the most important message as far as I'm concerned for me. Yeah. I mean, it's nice knowing that there are other people out there that are like-minded and whatnot, and there's comfort in that, and it's great at dinners and all of that stuff. But, I mean, when it comes to the work, it's from, it comes from me. I mean, again, I go back. I mean, like, I can tell you when I was in the Whitney program, they loaded us up with a lot of theory, okay? Which, I will be honest, I didn't understand 99% of it. I felt like these people were speaking in tongues, okay? Um, they use words that are, like, not in a dictionary. Uh, and, you know, at one point made me feel like I was stupid. I was like, holy shit, like... I don't know anything. This is crazy. And, um, and then I realized, like years later, I said, wow, these people were obviously seriously depressed because they had to alienate everybody and create this little mono cell of a world for themselves where they all spoke in the same tongue and everybody could go, wow, you're so smart because we don't understand a word of what you're saying. Okay, um, I can remember being at the Whitney program, I will not mention the artist, but she came in and she spoke for an hour, like all this, you know, paradigms and this and that and yada, 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 yada. And then she showed the work and she was doing these shopping bags. And she's talking about, you know, consumerism and stuff. And they were the ugliest things you've ever seen. You know, I was like, look, can we just go to Barney's or Bendel's? I mean, you find like far superior shopping bags, you know? And this woman just went on about it. And it was just like, this is amazing. That in itself for me was the art, was to be able to talk about nothing for an hour and then show something that was so ugly. And another thing <laughs> I say, like to students and whatnot, it's like, you can see when they get caught up in it. Like, like I'm at Yale now, and I'm doing, you know, crits and, you know, the whole thing. And it's sort of like, I feel like my purpose is to save graduate students from themselves. Because usually now, I come in and I see the work and I'm like, God damn, this is so fucking ugly. Like, what are you doing? Not only is it ugly, it looks like you never shot a photograph in your life. Right, like, I mean, somebody in elementary school could do something better than this, right? And then I have to say to them, I say, okay, because, you know, I don't want to be judgmental. <laughs> but I say to them, let me see the work that you applied to the school to get in, you know, like, let me see that work. And 90% of the time when I see that work, I'm like, oh my God, okay, thank God. You know, look, you have talent, look, this is great, look at the lighting you use, look at the message that you're trying to put out there, and look at this crap you just showed me. You know, like, what happened to you? Like, what's wrong? And that's when I say to them, you know, like, don't get caught up into all these other people's words, you know, because it's screwing you up, and you're making ugly stuff, and it's not cute, you know? And, they feel so liberated after that because nobody ever says it to them like that. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's running around pretending like they understand all of this stuff and really nobody does. Yeah. So I'm here to tell you, you know, 
just take it with a grain of salt, that stuff. You know, it sounds good in you know, the artist's statement and so on and so forth, but that's it. Don't live by that creed. don't teach the students how to manage their business. Is there any insights that you could share on that? Well, I happen to be a product of that, <laughs> like when I was in school. Like when I was in school, like I would say to you, um, especially coming out of a commercial industry of fashion, being in grad school and stuff, there was, I felt there was no competition. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody just did what they needed to do. Like, I can't do what you do, you can't do what I do. So there wasn't this competition thing going on. Now you've got a competition thing going on about who's making more money, who has more followers, who's doing you know hotel projects, who's doing this, who's doing that, and stuff like that. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not like the business entrepreneur person you know, of the century, far from it. Um, but, um, you know, I do what, I, all I do is basically I just do the work. I mean, to be honest. But that's not to say that if you have entrepreneurial skills and or, or know somebody that you're close to, that you should not be exploring all of those too. Yeah. I mean, I could definitely do more, you know, like sort of like on a commercial sort of tip, you know what I'm saying? But, um, I don't know, it's not really my mindset, but I mean, I have friends that are like cleaning up, you know, <laughs> like Kendi Wiley or Derek Adams, you know, McLean and those guys. I mean, they came after me, but they got that business sense thing down to a science, you know. And I like kind of look at them and I'm like, yeah, okay, that's cool, <laughs> you know, I want to do that too. But it's not really my sensibility, I would say. But I mean, I think it's great, you know, if you can balance the two. And it's true, in graduate school, they don't teach you anything about making money. Yeah. I mean, I think now maybe there might be changes to the curriculum where they're going to have to. But I know when I was in school, I mean, that wasn't even, in fact, it was like, oh, when I was in school, it was like, if you talked about money, ooh. That was like evil, <laughs> you know, because you were around a lot of people that had like trust funds, so they didn't have to think about money. <laughs> so it's like if you were talking about money, it was like almost sleazy, you know. But now that has changed, you know, 360 degrees. So. Hi, I have two questions. The first question is how you face the situation that you, your work didn't appreciate by others, your personal work, I mean, after you get tired of commercial work. And second, and second question is, you, you mentioned you went to a MFA and what you learned from it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I went to MFA here, right here on this floor, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I think I mentioned it earlier, it, what I got from it was I got the space and the time uh, to be able to explore and sort of figure out what it was that I really wanted to do. Um, that before that, when I was doing fashion, I mean, that message was not as concrete as it became um, in graduate school. Like I say to people, like your first year of graduate school or the first semester, like flounder, do whatever you want to do, um, experiment, and, but by the beginning of the second year, you better f know what you want to do. Because basically, in my opinion, you want to be able to graduate with a, a body of work and be ready to have your one woman or one man show when you're done, upon completion. And that was sort of my goal at that time, after I found the direction that I wanted to go in. And also, for my personal, it was like, also, like, I never really experienced, like, full-on, like, racism, which sounds hard to believe, but it's true, 
And it wasn't until I was in grad school that I had an incident where it became very clear to me. And that was a very pivotal moment also for me where I was just like, okay, bang, this is what I need to do. This is what I need to say. This is how I need to change things. So from race to motherhood to anything, my life situation and with my work, I would say it's been um, somewhat reactionary. You know, like my Rajay series, which is a superhero series, you know, comes out of a lack of black superheroes. And, you know, at the time I had children that were into Power Rangers and all of that. And my life has sort of progressed along that timeline. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, 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 uh-uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> How does it, it just comes about. I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, I work with the computer, but I do have a young person there who knows the shortcuts, who knows how to liquefy. You know, I just say to them, hey, let's do this, and they know how to do it, you know. So I sit there, and I tell her what to do, and then we try things, and then we see if things work, and if they work, then I use them, you know. But there is no, there is no plan, and that's where the joy comes from, that there isn't a plan, you know. I mean, that's what makes me happy, like when I finish creating like a piece, like where I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, I don't know where it's coming from, and on some level, I don't have to know where it's coming from. But it's coming, and they were coming a lot, so it was like it was really good, you know. But no, I couldn't be locked into an algorithm or anything like that. That would be just like heinous. And I mean, everything that you see there too, just FYI, is a human body. And everything you see there is shot by me too. I mean, no offense to you people that like to appropriate other people's stuff, but I don't. So. It's everything is mine. <laughs> are they models or are they people you know? Uh, both. Both. Um, like in some of them, this one doesn't have like a Jacques who's like, you know, kind of like a supermodel and stuff. There's, and there's people that I know. Like for this series, when I first started out, it started out as a, um, I do portraiture and uh, since high school. Black velvet background, you know, one light, you know, like a box or a big umbrella or something like that, or a beauty dish, one direction. And I'm interested in shooting the body. So I'd have people come into the studio. Everything's, I have a ladder, it's covered in black velvet. I'll have people climb up on the ladder and it's like, they'll start freaking out because they're like, I just thought we were doing a portrait, but it actually becomes like a complete workout. Because it'll be like, okay, get on top of the ladder, extend one leg out, one arm out, twist your body this way. And then I'm like shooting all of this stuff. And um, because I'm interested in like just sort of sections of the body and whatnot, not the whole thing. And it, it, came, it comes out of there. And then from there, I'm able to like build. Yeah. So. Is that it? Are we done here? Okay. <laughs> Before I forget, uh, please follow me on Instagram <laughs> at Renee Cox Studio. <laughs> uh, and one more thing, don't move because I need to get a selfie like with you guys in the background. <laughs>